With every advancement of DNA technology, cold cases are reopened more and more and are getting solved faster than ever before. Now, even DNA from a second cousin who has never even met the criminal in question can lead to a family getting justice. Number 5. The Cedar Rapids community was left shocked and appalled when 18-year-old Michelle Martinko's body was found in her family car outside of a mall in December of 1979. Michelle was still in high school at the time and had traveled to the mall to pick up a winter coat after attending a school choir banquet. The car was found still parked in the mall parking lot at 4 a.m. Michelle had tried to fight her attacker but couldn't stop him. Robbery was ruled out as a motive and police believed the nature of the attack indicated that it was personal. No fingerprints or weapons were found at the scene of the crime, but police were able to recover DNA. The person who had attacked Michelle had cut his hand and left some of his own blood on her clothes. Hundreds of people contacted police to try to help find the criminal that had taken her life, and police were given countless leads to follow. Every one led to a dead end. Two witnesses were able to give a description of a person of interest, a tall white man in his late teens or early 20s. More than 80 suspects were identified, but the vast majority were tested and were proven to have no links to the crime. Despite the best efforts of police and the local community, the case went cold. With advancements in technology, police continued to test their sample to try to find any new leads. Finally, in 2018, police found a match. Using genetic genealogy, police found an individual who was a distant cousin of the person who had attacked Michelle. The list of suspects was narrowed down to three brothers. Jerry Burns was 25 years old when Michelle died. He lived in a town about 45 minutes away from the scene of the crime. Whether he had any connection to Michelle remains unknown, but police believed either he or one of his brothers committed the crime. Police were able to discreetly collect DNA samples from the suspects and discovered Jerry Burns was the match they were looking for. He was arrested in December of 2019 on the anniversary of Michelle's death. Burns denied any involvement, though he couldn't explain how his DNA ended up in the car. Despite this, a jury found him guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. Number 4. At around 8.30 p.m. on May 17, 1976, Leslie Pinrod Harris left the restaurant where she was dining with her husband. They'd recently moved to the area in California and were staying at a hotel that night. The couple had an argument and Leslie told her husband she was getting a taxi back to the hotel alone. When John Harris returned to the hotel, she had never made it back. Eight hours after Leslie was last seen, her body was found on the roadside, just outside the perimeter of a marine air station in El Toro. She was discovered by military police, and at first her body couldn't be identified. But after her husband filed a missing person report, they realized who she was. Leslie's husband had been ruled out and police came to the conclusion someone from the base had likely taken her life. It wasn't a busy area and it seemed unlikely someone from the general public would have left her body there. Beyond that, police didn't have much information to go on and the case quickly went cold. DNA samples had been taken from the scene and repeatedly analyzed as new advancements in technology came into play. Each time, police were left at the same point they had started, with no new leads having been uncovered. 
Finally, in 2019, a genetic genealogy search identified a man named Eddie Lee Anderson as a suspect. Anderson was living in Louisiana at the time, but had been a Marine stationed at the base at the time of the crime. Unlike in other cases, police didn't need to stake out Anderson and wait for him to discard a drink can. They approached him up front and Anderson voluntarily supplied a DNA sample. It turned out to be a match and he was arrested and transported back to California. Anderson was in prison and awaiting trial when he passed away after contracting COVID-19. Number 3 Christine Frank's neighbors had grown concerned when they hadn't been able to get a hold of her on October 21, 2001. She'd come home from a double shift at a restaurant at Universal Studios City Walk earlier in the day, but since then, nobody had seen or heard from her. When they eventually managed to get into her apartment, they found her body inside. For 17 years, the identity of the person who took her life remained a mystery. Christine had died from a bullet wound, though none of the neighbors reported hearing anything unusual that day. One said they'd heard what sounded like glass breaking at around 4.30 p.m., but it seemed strange that that was the only thing that was heard. Luckily, there appeared to be more evidence at the scene. Police found fingerprints and DNA they believed belonged to the criminal responsible. The bullet casing was also found. Investigators chalked the crime up to a robbery gone wrong. The money Christine would have brought home from her double shift appeared to have been missing. It looked like someone had taken her life for a few hundred dollars. Unfortunately, the DNA and fingerprints led nowhere, and police couldn't narrow down the weapon used very far. Christine's family, friends and co-workers and acquaintances were investigated as detectives tried to find a DNA match but they turned up empty-handed every time. Even residents of a nearby behavioral treatment facility were tested, as one man claimed to know who the criminal was, but the lead turned out to be a dead end. Over the years, police were able to use DNA to construct a sketch of the person they believed they were looking for. The culprit was believed to be an African-American man aged around 25 years old. Unfortunately, the sketch led to no new leads and the case went cold again. Finally, in 2018, police discovered a relative of the criminal had uploaded a sample to a DNA website. John Hogan had wanted to find out more about his family history, particularly which of his ancestors may have been slaves and where they had originally come from. He submitted his DNA to an ancestry website and got back information about the hundreds of distant cousins he had. A few years later, a reporter from a local news station informed him that one of those distant cousins was believed to have taken Christine's life. Police had reconstructed John's family tree and slowly whittled down the suspects to just two people. One was offered a drink by an undercover officer he accepted and discarded the can in a dumpster after he was finished. DNA was taken from the can, but it was revealed he wasn't the man they were looking for. The only other suspect was Benjamin Lee Holmes. Holmes was trailed by police officers who were eventually able to collect a discarded cigarette butt. The DNA on it proved to be a match and Holmes was arrested 17 years after Christine had passed away. Police and Christine's family are confident the criminal has finally been found, though Holmes denies any involvement and is currently awaiting trial. Number 2 William Earl Talbot Jr was one of the first criminals in US history to be convicted based on genetic genealogy 
when he was finally sentenced for a crime he committed more than 30 years earlier. Jay Cook and a young woman named Tanya were high school sweethearts in 1987. Tanya had only recently graduated from high school and the two were living together in British Columbia. They'd been dating for about six months when in November of that year, Jay asked Tanya to accompany him on a trip to Washington to pick up some parts his father needed. He agreed and they left in Jay's father's van on November 18th. The couple made it into the US via a ferry and were spotted in the small town of Hoodspurt that evening. They had apparently gotten lost and a convenience store worker gave them directions to get back on track for their journey to Seattle. They were later spotted in another town, roughly 40 minutes from Hoodspurt and on the road to Seattle. Another shop worker reported seeing the couple and said they were alone and there didn't appear to be any trouble when they left. This was the last confirmed sighting of the couple alive. They never made it to the store to pick up the parts for Jay's father and they were reported missing the following day when they didn't return home. Not much progress had been made when Tanya's body was found on November 24th on a rural road close to Mount Vernon. She'd been bound before her life was taken. The vehicle she and Jay had been traveling in was found nearby with plastic ties and rubber gloves found inside. Also inside were ferry tickets purchased the day of the disappearance, which indicated Tanya and Jay had made it to Seattle before their trip had turned into a nightmare. There was no sign of Jay anywhere near Tanya, but two days later, his body was found 50 miles away. Investigators concluded he lost his life before Tanya, with Tanya being the criminal's main focus. Investigators were able to get DNA samples they believed belonged to the killer, but technology wasn't in place for it to be of any use. The case ran cold until 2018, when new advances in technology allowed forensic experts to recreate an age-progressed image of what they believe the attacker looked like 30 years after the crime. It did produce a handful of leads, but none led to a conviction. Finally, the DNA was run through a database which included samples from genealogy websites. It was the first time it had been attempted in the US, and investigators found two distant cousins of their criminal. Luckily, the cousins were on different sides of the family tree, so investigators could trace their trees until they connected when William Earl Talbot Sr. married Patricia Peters. They had four children together, three daughters and a son. Talbot Jr. had been a violent teenager and was estranged from the rest of the family when he became police's main suspect. After trailing him for a while, they were able to get a DNA sample from a paper cup he had thrown away, which confirmed he was the man they wanted. He was arrested and in June of 2019 was found guilty. Number 1 Often with cold cases that are eventually solved, the person believed to have committed the crime has already passed away. While this does mean the family can't get justice in a court of law, it can be a relief to finally get answers. One case where the culprit was identified too late was the death of Jodine Sarah. This case was and still is particularly disturbing as Jodine's parents came face to face with the criminal who took their daughter's life. It was Valentine's Day of 2007 and her parents had gone to her apartment to visit her. The chain was on her door but nobody answered when they knocked and Jodine's father forced his way in. Jodine's parents went to her bedroom where they found their daughter and a man. Embarrassed, they quickly left not realizing that Jodine had already passed away at this point. The man never emerged when they went back inside. 
they realized the man had left through the window and Jodine was no longer alive. Despite the fact Jodine's parents had seen the man responsible, police were unable to identify any suspects and the case went cold. DNA left by the criminal was used to create a sketch which helped narrow down a list of suspects, but it wasn't particularly helpful and didn't produce any new leads. Finally, in 2018, genetic genealogists were able to identify some of the criminal's distant relatives, and they were able to trace the family tree to a man named David Marbrito. Marbrito was a transient, but did have family in the area near where Jodine had lived. He had taken his own life in 2011. Strangely, police already had the man's DNA on file. He'd been stopped at a routine traffic stop in early 2011, and officers believed he matched the description of a suspect in another case. His DNA was taken, and he went on with his day. Not long after, he passed away, and the police department didn't bother to analyze the sample. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.